Earlier this year, I had a pretty big moment. For the first time in my life, I bought a house. Actually, <laughs> actually an apartment. Um, many of you will have experienced this as well. Uh, it was a really big moment for me because I never actually owned anything like that before. Um, the house is pretty cool. Everything I could wish for is in it, even has a balcony. A few weeks after I moved in, my mother visited. Uh, I showed her the entire thing, and as we walked around the house, um, of course, being my mother, she said that she loved it. After a while, we had a drink on the balcony, and then my mother did this, did this typical mother thing. She wondered, why is the kitchen so organized? Well, I have to admit that she wasn't necessarily wrong to be so surprised, because back when I was still living with my parents, uh, it was very hard to get me to do anything around the house. I never did the dishes, I never cleaned up my room, and now, no matter how often she would ask me, I just didn't seem to care. But now I kind of like it organized. Uh, it makes me feel good. So we talked a, bit, a little bit about this and about family matters. And after my mother left, her comment made me realize something. It got me thinking about ownership, about how we actually, when we actually own something, when we're in charge of it, then we tend to take care of it better. So why am I even telling you here about my new house, my childhood habits, and my mother's surprise that all my plates were in the right cupboard? This feeling of ownership that I felt in that kitchen made me realize that this was exactly what we've been doing to reorganize our product development at WeTransfer. We reorganized in a way that creates ownership, that creates caring. And that's what I was asked to talk to you about today. How to organize teams in a way that's better for the developers, better for the business, and I believe better for the users. For those of you who don't know WeTransfer, we are the simplest way to share your content with anyone, from your clients to your friends to your audience on socials. And most people know us from our web product. But we recently also launched a new mobile app, which you, of course, should all try out. Besides just quickly sharing stuff, uh, it also allows you to collect content from any app on your phone, where like images and links, and then, of course, you can share that again. So really simple. At WeTransfer, we believe creative thinking changes the world. As VP Engineering, my mission is to enable our development teams in their creative thinking. That's why I'm always looking for ways to create an environment where people have the space to develop themselves and think for themselves, so they can build the tools to keep users in their creative flow. We transfer originated out of an advertisement company, and until not too long ago, it was mostly operated as one. Product development, product development was a relatively small part of the company. Um, we had just one product, uh, one team of designers working on it, and one team of developers. Over time, we grew, and at the end of last year, we were actively diversifying our product offering and approaching over 100 people, of which 50 in the product, uh, product organization. During this growth, we noticed that we started to lose focus. Of course, we had plenty of great ideas, may, uh, maybe more than ever, but it became less and less clear to any individual in the company what they should be working on or what they shouldn't be working on. To remedy this, we started forming multidisciplinary teams, the idea being that they could each focus on different ideas and bring them to completion. These cross-functional teams had all the core resources needed to take on a task, like designers, software engineers, analysts, and a project manager. We identified some key projects that the business wanted to see completed, and we formed teams around those. The project managers facilitated the teams in their way of working and tried to make sure that the projects were delivered on time. In hindsight, 
this was the first big step towards a healthier and more scalable way of doing product development. It was a huge department from having rather isolated design departments and engineering teams and brought more focus to what people were working on. And yet, some key ingredients were missing. First, it turned out that the projects that we formed the teams around did not cover all of the work that needed to be done to keep the best business healthy. With the focus on their projects, uh, the teams didn't feel the responsibility to also work on stuff that their projects didn't touch. We ended up trying to patch this by forming sort of special teams focused on maintenance and basically anything that would otherwise fall through the cracks. But of course, the people in those teams, they had anything but focus. A second, while the different disciplines came together in each team, our operations team was still isolated. It became painfully clear that having a separated operations team focused on keeping our product running in, uh, in production was not scalable, but also didn't make our product more stable. In fact, the operations team, while they were true heroes, quickly became a bottleneck while at the same time lacking the intimate knowledge of the product that they needed whenever an incident in production occurred. And third, the teams were missing autonomy. And we know from research that autonomy is one of the intrinsic factors that drives motivation. The projects that the teams were focused around were driven by higher management. So the teams themselves were not intimately aware for the reasons of the reasons for doing them or the underlying outcome that we wanted to achieve by completing the project. So this was actually a lack in transparency and trust. It also made the job of the project managers very hard. It's very stressful to be managing a team that doesn't have the same motivation as the external stakeholders. So what does this tell us? We are a creative company for creative people, but we didn't give our developers the space to be creative and connect to our creative users. Of course, what the teams were missing was ownership. When we feel ownership over something, we tend to take care of it better. So that's what we set out to do. We reorganized our product development teams with ownership as the core value. We want our designers and our developers to build great products for our users, and we want them to do so because they care. We did that by giving them ownership. So we gave them the keys to the house. So I want to offer some insights into what we did to make this happen. I identify four key ingredients that we need to make teams feel ownership. And I'll go over each of them in a bit more detail in a second. First, we need cross-functional teams. Second, we have to think products over projects. Third, teams take on end-to-end -end responsibility. And the final ingredient is managing the teams on outcome instead of output. This first ingredient, combining several disciplines in a team, is one we already had in 2016, and the rest followed later. So the first pillar for creating true ownership in teams is having cross-functional teams. With all or most of the resources available to deliver, a team becomes really functionally independent. We used to have the separate design and engineering departments, and even within the engineering, the front-end developers and back-end developers would work in separate teams. The problem with this is that it creates a lot of dependencies between teams, and because of that, long feedback cycles or even misalignment. By having all the core skills available in one team, the team can function as a sort of a mini company. It can move fast without being dependent on other teams with their own agenda. This enables ownership over a complete functional part of the product. But of course, there's a balance. All of our teams, except for the platform team, have core roles such as product designers, front-end developers, back-end developers, and mobile developers. But to keep the teams lean enough 
to be efficient, the supporting roles such as quality assurance, user experience, and analytics are provided by horizontal teams. So cross-functional teams can function as a sort of a mini company that's autonomous in their resources. This makes them agile and enables them to move fast and experiment. As a second pillar, these cross-functional teams must be long-lived. This allows them to develop their own rituals and processes centered around an intimate knowledge of their product as a durable basis for that ownership. The teams we had in 2017 were project teams, temporary build-only teams focused on a specific business case. Product teams, on the other hand, are formed around a persistent business issue and are therefore long-lived. They focus on a durable workflow and keep a very deep familiarity with their product. That's, of course, not to say that product teams never change. Individuals can occasionally change teams, for example, to rotate senior people or to adapt to current resourcing needs. The teams themselves, are, however, are long-lived. This also means that ownership lies with the teams rather than with the individuals. In summary, a product team has the time and space to truly connect with their product, and this motivates to take care of it better. The third pillar is end-to-end -end responsibility for product teams over their product. This is a well-known DevOps principle, and it makes teams responsible for their product throughout its entire life cycle, from inception to maintenance and to potential decommission. Without this, you can only have partial ownership. Historically, our operations has been rather separated from development. Um, we found that not only this doesn't scale, operations have been a consistent bottleneck in our product development, but also that it doesn't incentivize developers to optimize for the production environment. We're now working towards a model where product teams deploy and run their products themselves on a self-service platform provided by the platform team. This lets them take back ownership over the product lifecycle, enabling shorter feedback loops and faster development cycles. And we consider our platform team a product team as well. Their product is a self-service platform, and their customers, if you like, are our product teams. They assume end-to-end -end responsibility over the platform they offer and the common services that are part of that, like a logging infrastructure, metrics, mail, uh, and deployment <coughs> platform. They are not operationally responsible for the products being run on it by the other teams. So the you build it, you run it model makes teams care more about how their product runs in production. When we care more, we try to make things better and we do it much more effectively. As a last pillar, our product teams are managed on outcome instead of output, giving teams high-level objectives for their product with the freedom to work towards them the way they want is the ultimate ingredient for ownership. This is what we didn't do so well last year. We told teams what to build and when, instead of making them responsible for what we wanted to achieve. Teams were not in charge of their own roadmap and therefore didn't feel ownership over their product. We can generalize the end-to-end -end responsibility DevOps principle from just the engineering part to the entire product development, and then also make the teams responsible for the product on a product management level, and that's what we are actually doing now. And to support this, we use OKRs, as popularized by Google. Uh, but any framework for tracking objectives and outcomes can, can work for you. The OKR framework consists of inspirational abstract objectives and complemented by concrete ways of measuring progress against them. And these are called key, key results in the framework. The OKRs are defined on a quarterly basis by the teams together with leadership and shared transparently with the entire company, including the progress against them during the quarter. 
So directing our teams by outcome is transparent and states intent. Using their intimate knowledge of the product, the teams can pursue these outcomes with a great deal of freedom. Being told what to achieve rather than what to do is a driver for creativity. I'd like to go over an example of using this approach at WeTransfer. We formed a product team around the use case of our new mobile app that I showed before. This team is, a, is exploring the capture and collect stage in the creative workflow. This team is cross-functional. They have core roles such as a product manager, product designer, mobile engineers, backend engineers, and front-end engineers. This allows them to move fast and independently. But of course, they're not completely independent. They work together with supporting horizontal teams like quality assurance, marketing, and analytics. As a team, they are the long-term owners of their product. And in this case, their product is all of our mobile apps, the display of boards from those apps on all of our other platforms, and the backend services for those. The, so the team does not just exist around, for example, building the next iOS app release. No, they are in it for the long, for the long run. They exist around a persistent business case, and in this case, that is the capture and collect stage in their creative workflow. So products over projects. Apart from just creating this product, they have the end-to-end -end responsibility over it. They have all the tools needed to operate the backend services and can deploy new releases to production. This includes access to metrics, monitoring, and logging. The common tooling and infrastructure behind this is the platform as a service that is provided by the platform team. And the direction of, this, of the work of this team is captured by one OKR. And for example, last quarter, this was grow the collecting use case, uh, grow the collecting user base. And the corresponding key result was grow our weekly active collectors to from certain number to another number. So this is clearly an outcome. How to get there is mostly up to the team, but of course they are supported in it by key stakeholders. Any initiatives they work on to advance their key results, they share in a publicly available roadmap. So this is how we manage on outcome rather than on output. And these four things together, they foster a feeling of ownership. They motivate the team to take responsibility and take care of their product and make it better for their users. So how, how are we doing? A lot of the things I talked about are very hard to quantify. I talked about ownership, about feeling connected to a product, and about motivation and about caring. These are all things that are best measured by just asking people. So after about half a year in the new way of working, we reflected on our product development. And based on that feedback and our own observations, I identified three, three areas for improvement. So what have we learned? First, we underestimated the impact of the existing backlog of projects that we had. Some of the new teams were more or less bootstrapped by giving them some existing projects that were already underway. But of course, you don't magically feel ownership over a task that's just handed over to you, especially when you're not involved in the ideation process. We could have prevented this someone by giving the teams more time and space to develop their OKRs and then let them deci decide to take on their, these projects, or maybe not. I think as a business, we were a little bit too afraid to never see these projects reach completion. But instead, we should have focused more on the intended outcome. Second, and this surprised me a bit, individuals don't always see how their work connects to the mission we have as a company. I had hoped that the OKRs would make this very clear, but apparently we need to do better there. When defining team OKRs for the quarter, it is vital that it is crystal clear how they connect to the company mission. And every issue description that the team uh, creates should include what it does against the team OKRs. And you can also use this during prioritization. 
As a third learning, we learned not to ignore the rest of the organization. Uh -huh. Giving teams the amount of autonomy we are giving them asks for a lot of trust. You can build that trust by A, explaining the why for everything that you're doing, and B, being very transparent. Each product team sends out weekly updates to the company. Their OKRs and their roadmaps are public. And we have an open demo session after every sprint for the entire company to attend. So that's very transparent. But we could still do better by including the why in all of our communication. For example, a team can begin their demo sessions by reiterating their OKRs and also explaining how what they are demoing relates to those OKRs. Overall, the feedback that we, uh, that we got clearly showed that we were on the right track. So we were seeing improved focus, definitely. We saw better team dynamics, and we saw a more agile way of working that people generally enjoyed. And another thing that was going well, people noted is how, how we're open to change. As a company, we're dedicated to continuously improving being uh, by being critical. When we set out at the beginning of the year, we made it explicit that we would regularly evaluate and iterate. So we firmly believe that the changes we made were game-changing improvements, but also that we can always do better. So today I talk about ownership. When I was living with my parents, I did not run the household. I was not responsible for the entire thing, and now I am, and that makes me care more about my clean kitchen. And we transfer originated out of an advertisement agency in 2009 and has grown rapidly ever since. More and more, we are turning into an actual tech company, rooted in a passion to create and to enable others to create. We are doing that with these four ingredients. First, we have cross-functional teams. We think products over projects. We give the teams end-to-end -end responsibility, and we manage them on outcome. Our teams feel ownership because of it, and they take care of their product. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Martijn? Over there. All right, thank you very much. Um, I was thinking if you could elaborate a little bit on the split between the platform team and the product team, and where does the ownership of the platform team finishes and the ownership of the product team starts? Yeah. Uh, and maybe related to this also on the tooling decisions, so how much of the tooling decisions are owned by the platform team and where uh, the product teams have, let's say, the autonomy to pick their own tools? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so first, let me make it clear that th this is a w uh, ongoing work on our side. So of course, if you change the way you manage the teams and, and what they own, that doesn't magically change the technologies behind it. So of course, we have a lot of products that are already running. Um, and historically, uh, the production side of that was owned by the platform team. But as I explained, that, that didn't work so well because they don't know the products very well. So if something, if an incident occurs in production, then they don't actually know how to fix it. So we are now working for new services and also have also already migrated some old services to a new platform. That's a platform as a service, as I explained, where the platform team is responsible for any like common supporting services like email infrastructure and logging and metrics, et cetera. Uh, but also the deployment pipelines. And the product teams then build and run their projects on top of that. Uh, we do that with tooling for now. Uh, with, uh, we run everything in AWS. Um, all our infrastructure is defined in Terraform. And the product teams use Terraform workspaces to define their products on top of the, the common infrastructure. Any other questions? Over here in the middle. Almost. Here. What's the team size you have on the cross-functional teams? Um, it depends a little bit uh, about like the, the area they spend of the product. Um, so some of the team actually have their own products, uh, but of course our main product is 
still by far the, the largest product, so we split that up in area, in certain areas by function mostly. Um, they range from, uh, I would say, including product managers uh, from around five to uh, nine, I, I think we have one with 10, yeah. And for the, for the large uh, products, um, you have multiple teams, how do you make them glue together? That's a challenge, yeah. So they, they, there are still code bases that are actually co-owned by, uh, by several teams um, because they are so central. Um, I expect that to change over time when the teams are exist for a longer period and they develop new features or they have to change part in the product. Um, I think they will naturally come to the conclusion that it might be a good idea to extract part of that and start owning that as a separate servers by their team as a, as a own. Um, but to come to your, to your question, uh, how, how do you seek alignment in the way they technically develop that product? I guess that's, that's basically your question. Of course, that's a big role for me to uh, give them a technical vision in how we develop our product. Um, but they also have, so, uh, in some companies, you call them chapters. For example, the backend engineers, they all come together once a week and they show each other what they're working on. Um, and that is all facilitated by the lead backend engineers and the front-end engineers have similar things. Any other questions? No? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.